Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope everyone had a good week and weekend in the last couple of weeks since I've seen you. Um, last week we talked about, why can't I remember his name? Vince, Vincent Lee and how he murdered Tim McLean on the bus. So I was wondering if anyone got this right this week. We were going to be talking about Clifford Olson. But before we talk about him, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that I'll be linking all my socials down low and putting them here. I will also be putting down below every product I use on my face. I don't really show all the products I use on my face while I'm doing my makeup. And I know a lot of you have uh, requested that I did do that, but I just want to let everyone know that it will be down below. So if you guys do decide that, oh, I wonder what she's using, or I like that palette, or the eye makeup looks great, I wonder what she used, it will be linked below. So with further ado, let's get into Clifford Olsen. All right, I'm just jumping on here quickly to let you guys know that I forgot to do a disclaimer. This story is not appropriate for children. This story has some graphic uh, events that have happened that I do say. So please do not watch this if you have... If you feel like you can't handle it and you just turn it off, I totally understand that. This is a very dark story of something that has happened. A man did some horrible things. So I'm just putting a disclaimer on here that there is talk about sexual assault. There is talk about murder. There is talk about abducting children. So please, if this is any of these things are uncomfortable to you, please do not continue. And I totally understand if you don't continue because this is a dark story. So let's go on with the story. Clifford was born in 1940 in Victoria, BC. He was the eldest child of Clifford and Leona. Clifford Jr. grew up in a small house near the Pacific National Exhibit grounds. Clifford Jr.'s dad, Clifford Sr., delivered milk in those days. He was the last milkman to use a horse and buggy. So that was kind of cool. Clifford's mom, Leona, was a housekeeper and she mostly spent her time working and taking care of Clifford. Clifford was her light, her joy, her everything. She nourished him. She took care of him. She did everything for Clifford while he was growing up. After the war, the family moved to the sprouting suburbs of Richmond, B.C. Um, into just one of the schemes. There was a scheme going around for veterans. And uh, Clifford Sr. was a veteran at that time. So there was a scheme for housing for veterans. So they moved into a very small uh, house. So Clifford Sr. Uh, remembered that Clifford Olson was just, he was just a short, stocky old um, little kid who was always getting into fights. So one day, Clifford Jr. went to his dad and said, hey dad, I want to become a boxer. And his dad said, okay, well, we can help you with that. And once Clifford did become a boxer, he started going around to each kid that he was bullying him and settling the scores. So he was beating up all the kids who were beating him up in a sense. So he was getting into fights all, uh, all the time. So it wasn't that great of a childhood. So he started skipping school around the age of 10. And once he completed grade eight, he quit altogether and started to embrace the life of crime. Leona bore two more kids, uh, Richard and Dennis. So she had two more sons and a daughter named Sharon. All of them grew up to be law-abiding middle-class citizens. Nothing was wrong with them. They followed the rules. They finished high school. They did all of that. And then there was Clifford. Clifford Jr., was a loner. He was a loser. He was a failure to the family. He just always got into fights. He was always starting drama. And he went to jail for the first time in 1957 at the age of 17. So over the following 24 years, Clifford chalked up over a hundred different convictions. He had DUIs, stolen properties, break and entering, obstruction of justice, just to name a few. So in 1965, Clifford was serving three and a half year sentence because of break and enter. So Clifford was kind of a scheme. He always tried to like, he broke out of jail a lot. He was known to always consistently break out of jail. So he started going to the library at the jail he was at and he would read books about this one certain illness. So as he was reading the books about it, he would tell the gods that he wasn't feeling good, but he wouldn't automatically say like, 
uh, this is my disease. I feel this way. These are the symptoms. I must have this. He would say he's not feeling good. Wait a couple weeks and then up the symptoms. So it looked like he was getting pretty serious. Like, oh, this guy's actually really sick. So the gods took him to the police or the, the doctor on site at the penitentiary. And the doctor said, hey, you're going to have to pee in a jaw and then we're going to do some tests. So when Clifford went to go pee in a cup, he cut himself so that pee, like the blood would get into his pee. So it looked like he was peeing urine. So once that happened, the doctor at the time was like, okay, this is really serious. He has blood in his urine. We're going to have to ship him to a different hospital. So as he was getting shipped to the hospital, he waited for the perfect time. So he was sitting there in his, um, in his area, in his unit, in his hospital bed. And he waited until the RCMP or the police who was with him left him unattended. And that's when he struck. He jumped out the window and he escaped. So this was about, I think, the chase involved a, over 100 different officers. And he was out for about a week on the loose. So Clifford was finally nabbed at the border of Washington because one of the dogs named Tigger who was a police dog, sniffed him out. And that's how he got caught. And he got brought right back to jail. Once Clifford got back into jail, he was known to prey on children. Not not like children, children. He was known to prey on 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds, people who were younger who did come into jail and was forced to be in the um, penitentiary with adults. So that wasn't a good look because now he's preying on children. So that makes him a pedophile. If you know anything about jail, they do not appreciate pedophiles. He was also known to be a snitch. So that was also not a good look for him because he would snitch out to the gods everything that was going on. So Olson was uh, released on mandatory supervision seven times in 1970s, but each time his actions while he was out, made him come back to prison. So he was put back into prison in the 1976 in Prince Albert Penitentiary. Clifford was stabbed seven times by inmates who were sick and tired of him snitching over drugs. So Clifford alerted um, the police that there is prisoners who are bringing in drugs. So Clifford was stabbed seven times and brought to the hospital. So Clifford was brought back to the hospital due to the fact that he was stabbed seven times and they thought he wasn't going to make it. He did survive after that. So after Clifford had the attack on his life, Clifford became pretty cocky because he survived being stabbed seven times. He was an informant to the police and they had to move him to the maximum unit in Prince Albert. So he was officially moved and he... Had to be there, but he still thought, hey, I'm going to still be an informant to the police. You think he would like learn his lesson that people just tried to kill you because you are crazy and you are a snitch in the prison system, but he seemed to not care. So while he was in the maximum unit, he met this individual named Gary Francis Maku. So Gary Francis Maku was in there because he was being investigated for the murder and rape of a nine-year-old little girl. Although police didn't have really any evidence on him, he was there and they were still trying to do an investigation. So um, Clifford was like, maybe I can get some, get a convict, like get him to confess that he murdered this little girl. So over time, he slowly gained trust from Gary and like asked him about the crimes and was wondering like, Hey, did you like, didn't straight up ask him, did you do it? Like was just trying to get him. So finally Clifford convinced Gary to write down step-by-step step what he did with the little goal. So Gary did that and gave it to Clifford. Um, Clifford did say that he did think that Gary was, Oh, sorry. Gary did say that he did think Clifford was just going to use the step-by-step step that he wrote down as porn for him to masturbate to. So that was another, so that's what all he thought he was going to use it for. So, 
As Clifford Olson talked to Gary, he was learning from Gary's mistakes. He would read, he would understand what Gary did wrong and why Gary got caught. Clifford slowly started to dream about what he would do differently if he got released. He was determined that he could do it better than Gary. So he... So Gary was finally convicted. He was convicted and sentenced to 25 years with no parole. So while one child killer was put behind bars, there was another child killer just sitting there waiting to get released and ready to start his journey of becoming one of the worst serial killers in Canadian history. So... Clifford was released from prison in the 1980s of January, and he was 40 at the time. Once Clifford was released, he went back to his usual life of crime. So on February um, 1980s, Clifford met his future wife, Joan. She was a recently divorced woman who... um, got out of a very serious relationship. She survived um, an abusive relationship. She was she was just happy to be out of that marriage. However, the relationship she had with Clifford was nothing better. Clifford usually drank a lot and would hit her and he would yell at her. And when she confronted him, he would just do it worse. He would brutally beat her all the time. But yet, she was in total fear of, a fear of him, and Clifford used this to his advantage. So Clifford would take her money whenever he wanted, and she couldn't say anything because she was so scared of him. So Clifford would cons- constantly abuse her and rape her, but over the time, he wasn't satisfied with that enough, which is pretty messed up if you ask me, like... He's he's a horrible guy from start to finish, from once he was a child to where he is now. He is just horrible. So he wasn't satisfied with just brutalizing her in every way, shape, or form. So he started going on the hunt. So what he would do is he would go down to bars and motels and he would prey on children. So he would wait until he saw a teenager who was sitting outside and he would wait for them and then he would ask them, Oh, you guys, do you guys need a job? I own a contract company. And he would hand them a business card. And once they would finally get comfortable because he was a very charismatic and charming individual, they'd be like, yeah, sure, we'd want a job. And at that time, he was offering them $10 to be a window washer. And that was a crazy amount of money to be a window washer. I guess it was like seven times the amount that a window washer would get back then. So they would say yes, and they'd be excited. And he would be like, hey, get in my car. And then finally give them drugs and alcohol. So once the teenagers got drunk, he would uh, then force them to have sex with him. If they were willing to have sex with him, he would then take them back to his place and have sex with them in front of his wife, Joan. So she absolutely hated this, but every time it happened, he would then corner her in a drunken rage in a different part of the house and tell her that if if she tells anyone, he is going to kill her. So she really had nothing to do. And I know a lot of you people are thinking, hey, um, why didn't she just leave? If you're in an abusive relationship, it's it's not that easy, right? Sometimes you feel trapped. She was scared of him. He keeps he kept threatening to kill her. So she was very terrified of him. So in November of two, 2000, in November in 1980, Clifford and his now pregnant, so she's now pregnant, girlfriend got into a huge fight. So Clifford got angry. He was drunk. She confronted him and he beat her up really bad. So he decided, hey, I'm drunk. I'm going to leave. I'm going to steal some money so I can go get some more alcohol. So while he was gone and he came back to find out that Joan had left. So Joan wrote a note that was the only thing left in the house. And it said, you love your alcohol more than you love me, which is a hundred percent true in this case. He is always in a drunken state. He beats her up when he's drunk. He clearly cannot handle his alcohol. So it is true that he loves his alcohol more than he loves her. So he was pissed. 
So he's go- decided I'm going out looking for her because he was scared at that time that she was going to tell somebody what he had been doing, how he's been um, sleeping with teenagers, how he's been abusing her and raping her. So he's like, I have to get out there and I have to find her before she decides to tell the cops, to tell her family, to tell her friends what is going on. So while Clifford was out looking for her, he got distracted from one, he is drunk at this point. He got distracted and he decided that Well, he didn't decide anything. So he saw Christina Wello was um, riding her bike to the motel that she was staying at. So he struck up a conversation with her, his usual little conversation that he struck up with anyone. And he asked her, what is she doing? Became charming to her and then asked her if she wanted a job. And she said, yeah, she does. So It's a poor neighborhood. She was poor. She was living in a motel. It wasn't the best place for her, right? So she did say, yeah, she would like a job. And then he offered it to her. And then he said, can I give you a ride home and let you meet the other employees and we'll have a beer to celebrate. And she was like, hell yeah, let's do it, right? So she got into the vehicle with Clifford and they proceeded to have beers. So then they ended up at a random house and Clifford said to her, hey, um, we're just waiting for another employee to get here. And, um, then he kissed her and she kissed him back, which is, she was pretty young at the time. I think she was like 13 or 14, which was pretty gross. So then he kissed her back and then was like, do you want some weed? But if you want the weed, you're going to have to come with me and go pick it up. And she definitely agreed, um, to this. And at the time he kept giving her beers and more beers until she was passed out. So then when he went back to his house, he realized she wasn't there. Joan wasn't at his house anymore. She was, she just, she left, right? His wife, it was girlfriend at the time was gone. So he grabbed a bunch of sleeping pills. So when he got back, um, Christina realized that he didn't have the weed. And she mentioned it to him like, oh, you don't have the weed. And he's like, I got something better for you. So that's when he gave her sleeping pills and drove around until she passed out. Once she passed out, he pulled her out of the car and he forced himself on her multiple times. He took her body afterwards. Well, not her body. He took her to a riverbank and then strangled her and proceeded to stab her multiple times. After he was done with that, he decided that he was gonna hide the body in a blackberry bush. Clifford cleaned out his car once he got home and burned the clothes that he was wearing and then asked his girlfriend, Joan, when she got back, if they could go on a little vacation just because he wanted to, you know, have an alias or have like, hey, I'm, I was gone. I was on vacation when that happened. That can't be me. So that's what he did. So he proceeded to do that. Christina's family assumed that she was a runaway. She was known to consistently always try to leave. She was running away multiple times. So they didn't think anything of it. And they didn't even call the cops because they were like, she's a runaway. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do. She probably just disappeared somewhere. We're not going to call the cops. She was riding a friend's bike at the time. And the friends who had the bike was very much concerned. But when he tried to call the cops, they said that you cannot, um, file a missing persons report for a teenager or a youth unless you are a family. And since her family didn't seem to care, nothing was done. And Clifford was not a suspect at all. And he now has the first taste of murder. So he got away with it. He literally got away with murder. He thinks that he is the best. He followed, he remembers what Gary did and he did the opposite of that and he never got caught. So then from November, to April of 1980s, Clifford didn't do anything. So he didn't um, murder anyone. He kind of laid low and he just went back to his normal raping of people instead of actually murdering them. So then um, he started getting tired of that. So he was kind of thinking like, you know what? I could probably do better than this. I could probably, um," he was like, this isn't enough. I need to go back and murder someone. 
So in April of 1916, 1981, Colleen, oh my God, sorry, Colleen, she was 13 at the time and she was a short young lady and she was coming back from a friend's house and that's when, um, why does this one look so brown and this one looks yellow? I mean, orange, why is this brown? What is happening? Oh, okay, I'm going to keep attempting to lay more and hopefully it turns out orange. Alrighty, back to the story. Sorry, makeup mishap. That's what happens on this show. So he picks her up, 13, and he follows his same book of traits. He asks her for a job. He then gives her alcohol and drugs. He proceeds to force himself on her. Just the same old, same old. So... He took her to a wooden area and while they were walking, he took out a hammer and he proceeded to smash her head in with the hammer and then he would force himself on her again. So then he would force himself on her again and again and then he did the same thing where he hid her in a bush and that was it with her. Again, she was known in the family as to be a runaway so the RCMP seemed to not care He said that, you know what, she's known to be a runaway, so we're just going to leave it as that, which is really sad. doesn't matter if the kid's a runaway. Like, where are they? They are youth. They can't really survive on their own, or they probably don't have any money, so you think that they would do something. So on April 22nd, 1981, 16-year-old Darren had got into Clifford's car Clifford gave him drugs and alcohol and followed his usual playbook. He would wait until the individual was passed out or super drunk, and then he would force himself on top of him. Clifford um, killed Darren and left his body again in some bushes and tried to hide him so he wouldn't be found. Then on May 19th, 2081, Sandra, 16, tried to hitchhike because she was going for lunch with her um, boyfriend and Clifford Olson picked him up. So Clifford Olson picked her up. He did the exact same thing. He went through his same playbook where he would give them alcohol, drugs, and then wait until he would force himself on them and then kill them and hide them in a bush. So June 21st, 1981, Ada Court, age 13, went missing on her way to meet her friends. So unlike the other victims, Ada was from a very well-known family, was from a family who wasn't broken up, who was very peaceful, who didn't seem to have any concerns. So once she went missing, they instantly called RCMP and reported her missing because they did not know where she went and that was weird for her at the time. So they were called and the RCMP didn't consider her a runaway just due to the fact that she was from a well-known family and that's why they didn't think she was a runaway. So they And they also didn't think any of these murders or runaways were connected because they did find a few of the bodies. They found one around Christmas. Christina's was around Christmas. Um, They found her body then. So they just assumed that it was they went missing or they were murdered when they decided to run away. And they didn't put any connection to any of these murders altogether. Um, On July 2nd of 1981, after breakfast, a nine-year-old Simon was on his way to his friend's house when Clifford Olson picked him up. Clifford Olson then brought him back to where he first killed Christina, and he did try to reenact the murder. He forced himself on Simon. He stabbed him multiple times. He... um, strangled him and then dumped the body this one was also reported missing right away due to the fact that simon was only nine years old and was too young to be considered a runaway so the rcmp immediately declared him missing so in july of 
July 9th of 1981, sorry, um, there was a lady, a lady, a child named Judy who was picked up by Clifford Olsen. Clifford did the same thing to her. He forced himself on her while she passed out. And he also murdered her. But he murdered her where he murdered Ada. So he was, uh, or Ada, he kept bringing them back to where he was, where he killed them, his original people. So the RCMP already kind of had those sights on him just due to the fact that he was known as a criminal and he was was convicted multiple times for um, sexual assault and sex crimes. So that's why they were having him on the radar, but they didn't have any proof to really arrest him. July 15, 1981 the RCMP decided to process a case against Clifford. So they, Clifford for the disappearance of Ada. The RCMP were consider of doing a surveillance on him. However, they weren't 100% sure because first of all, surveillance costs a lot of money and whoever is doing the surveillance are not allowed to intervene with any illegal criminal activity. So it doesn't matter what Clifford did, they're not allowed to intervene. So... July 23rd, Clifford, 81, picked up. He's not 81, the year is 81, sorry. Clifford picked up Raymond Jr., who was 15. Clifford lowered the boy in with, yet again, another promise of Rourke, and he smashed his head in with rocks and dumped the body on campgrounds. Then um, the dad knew something was up right away and considered Raymond missing after... I think it was five hours. He called in right away, said he was missing, and the RCMP took this very seriously and connected the investigation to Clifford. Without the police being able to stop Clifford, though, Clifford went out again and decided to murder another child. So on July 27th, 81, Clifford picked up Terry, and who was 15, and uh, did the exact same thing he always does, promise a job, promise a all that stuff to her and he beat her head in with a rock and he dumped the body again in the Fraser River this time. So then on July 30th, 81, he picked up Louise of 15. Clifford abducted her, drove her to a gravel pit near Whistler, the ski resort, and beat her head in and again forced himself on him which he did to all of them and then he killed her and dumped the body so on august 5th the rcmp discovered raymond's body so they discovered that he was murdered and they also discovered ada's skull there too so then they decided that they were going to do a full 24 hour um, surveillance on Ray- on Raymond, on um, Clifford, so they can see what he's doing. But remember, you're not allowed to do anything, right? You're not allowed to, if you're the surveillance people, you're not supposed to interject if any criminal activity is happening. So at this time, they were doing 24-hour surveillance on him, and this was August 12th, I believe it was, and um Clifford picked up two 13 year old girls and drove them to a remote area and was going to murder them also however the surveillance police could not sit back and let this happen and they said that they had to do something so there were the surveillance police interject and they tackled um Clifford and they arrested him. They did say that they, they were, when they arrested him, he wasn't that nice to them. And he was like mocking them and was like, oh, you arrested a man who's having a picnic with these ladies and no, 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 no. Like he was like, you guys got nothing on me. You're not going to put me away to jail because I haven't done anything illegal. You can't prove that I did anything. And he was mocking them. So they brought him back and they started to do an investigation on Clifford for the deaths of these kids. They did seize his car and they did find the name of Jody, which was one of the individuals that he did murder. And this was the only physical evidence that they did have for Clifford 
being considered the murderer of the children. So they interviewed him and investigated him for days and nothing came about it. So the investigators were becoming desperate at this time and they asked him straight up, what does it take for you to get a confession? And Clifford Olson said, you have to pay me. So he wanted um, $10,000 per murder and they were sitting at 11 murders at this time. Unfortunately, with the Canadian government, you cannot be, um, you cannot profit from your crime. So they had to do a loophole and they gave the money to his wife, Joan, and their child. And their child's name is Clifford Jr., not Jr., Clifford the Third. sorry. So they gave, they said that they could give the money to her and Clifford was like determined that he was going to take that money from her right when he could. So Clifford asked for $110,000 for the 11 crimes that he, for the 11 murders. And the RCMP said, no, they'd give them, give him a hundred thousand, but he would have to show them new evidence or a new body of the 11, um, murders. And Clifford was like, fine. So during the couple weeks after that, Clifford brought the RCMP to the 11 victims, to the dead bodies, and to where he would murder them and do despicable things to. He said that he got joy watching the RCMP scrum and he would describe to them what he did to these children. On January 11th, 1982, Clifford pled guilty to 11 murders and was convicted of all 11 murders and was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences in Canada. While this case was going on, people were wondering how the RCMP got Clifford to say anything. So then once one um, reporter found out that they gave him money. And let me tell you, once that got out, everything exploded. People went nuts. They paid a criminal who murdered 11 children $100,000 to confess to a crime. So people were not happy about this, especially the parents of the victims. They believed the Canadian government was rubbing salt in their wounds. They thought this was just despicable. This was disgusting. They did not enjoy this whatsoever, which like you kind of have to admit that it's not great. You shouldn't be paying a convicted murderer money to give evidence about a ch- that they murdered kids. He, he was a murderer. He was a child murderer and he killed 11 kids, potentially more. They never got all the evidence and now we're supposed to just be okay with it and give him money so he can confess. After everything went down with the case of Clifford Olson, the, um, a lot of the RCMP who were on the case had to step down due to the fact of everything that went down and them having to pay money. They had to be moved around, all kinds of stuff. So they were moved around. Also, the families of the murder victims, they were outraged and they could not trust the RCMP who was in that area anymore, thinking that they were just going to pay criminals to give them evidence. When Clifford was in jail, he would still torment all of the family members who he killed. He would um, write them letters detailed in what he did to each one of the kids, which is, to me, that's absolutely horrible. This guy's already done so much to the families, and now he's doing this. Like, can that family catch a break? So he would continually write them letters explaining to them what he did to them, to their kids, to their sons, to whoever. And um, the families were so outraged by this, right? So they decided that they were going to sue Clifford's wife for the money that she got. However, they did not win that trial due to the fact that she was also technically a victim of Clifford Olson. She was beat, she was raped, she was everything. So she did get the money. Um, 
She finally divorced him in 1985. She divorced him. She changed her name. And she also changed changed her son's name. So he's no longer Clifford III. No one knows what he is. She kind of vanished, which was probably the best thing for them not to be associated with this guy. So while Clifford was in jail, he served the rest of his life in jail. He was about 71 when he died. He was diagnosed with colon cancer, and now he's dead. Um, I don't really know how I feel about this story. I'm going to go put my lashes on, and I will come back and give you guys my final thoughts of what I think about Clifford Olsen. All right, I am back now, guys. Put on my lashes. We all know that takes a while for me. I'm still not the best at it yet, but I'm getting there. So what do you guys think about Clifford Olsen? I feel like this is another case where the RCMP took their time with it or they didn't think it was a justifiable case or they just were like, oh, they're just runaway kids. So I feel like this is the second one that we have gone over where the RCMP kind of was slack. Not trying to like say anything bad about the RCMP in Canada, but it's just what I noticed on the last couple of cases. So Clifford Olson is a horrible person. He did some horrible things. I am happy he's in jail. He did die, which is like, don't they all die and they never get to actually like suffer for what they did. Um, I do feel horrible for his wife. He treated her horribly. He did some horrible things to her and she never got the justice. Yes, he did go to jail, but nothing ever came about it with her. And I feel really bad about that. I am happy that she dipped on him. She took the kid and left. I uh, hope the kid never really gets to know who his real dad is just because of how horrible and what he did. All right, so that is Thriller Thursday for today. So I want to thank each and every one of you guys for coming. I hit over 300 views on my last video, which is amazing. Thank you guys so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe here. I will also be putting my socials here. So make sure you guys follow me to keep up with the updates. I do go on every Saturday and I on my Instagram story and let you guys know or give you guys a hint who I'll be doing for next week. So make sure you guys follow me there so you guys don't miss out on the hints. Uh, next week is going to be Alberta. So let me guys, let me know who you guys think I should do. I don't have anyone in mind particular right now. So let me know what you guys think, who I should do. Leave a comment down below. If there's anything else you guys think I need to work on, I am working on my beauty room right now. So next week you should see me in a different environment. I won't be sitting here. I'll be having a different wall and have everything all set up there. So I'm super excited about that one. Um, so yeah, let me know guys what you guys thought of this video and what your favorite parts are, what you didn't like, and just let me know what you guys thought. So I will see you guys next week. All right, thank you, bye.